the story that left me uh, most moved, and I'll, and I'll stop at this point, the story that left me uh, moved the greatest was the story of the two buddies who had been born in the same hospital over in Bakersfield, grew up together, knew each other all the way along the line, uh, played football together in high school, were co-captains of the team, moved on into junior college, uh, where, again, they uh, both served on the football team. One of them was student body president, and then they both came to Cal Poly, and on the day of the, of the, on the, day of the plane crash, they chose, they sat together, as always, up front, and, um, and when the plane crashed, uh, both of them uh, died. Uh, Bob Bostrom has a few words for you, and so I'll get off the get, get off the mat. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Bob Bostrom. He was in charge of student housing at that time. And Bob, would you uh, give us a few words about the view from here on the campus after the uh, I was really sorry that I accepted Don's invitation to speak today because it required that I look over lots of sad documents that I hadn't looked at for a long, long time. I was director of housing, although we called a resident supervisor counselor in those days, and it was required to live on campus, which I loved, and I lived in Hillcrest Cottage, which is located between uh, Trinity and Santa Lucia Halls. That afternoon, I had listened to the ball game, and I'd been clean, cleaning my house. I was a bachelor in those days, and uh, I'd been cleaning the house, and I, I laid down on a couch to have a little nap and was in that foggy, half-conscious, half-unconscious state when I heard on the radio that was still on that there'd been a plane crash, and I thought, well, I should get out of this semi-conscious state and see what's going on, and the telephone rang. And it was a reporter for the Detroit News Press. And I think, oh, why is he calling? I said, he said, can you tell me who was on the plane, who was on the team? I said, what's happened? And he, he was the one that really told me <clears throat> about the crash. And uh, I came across some notes uh, that I'd made that night that I hadn't seen since then in one of the programs, about 15 to, or 20 to 25 students injured. That was all he knew. I never left the house without a tie on. It was kind of a, a badge of something. And uh, so I, I got dressed and put a tie on, and I, <clears throat> Lynn Dyke, who was a student wrestler and also a dorm manager, and that's what we called him in those days, came over to my house uh, to talk about it. And, and uh, I had him stay at the house in case there were other phone calls. And, I left there and went, I thought I'd go down to security. I could probably get more direct information there. They would be the source of information. Remember, it's Saturday night, and the tent campus is pretty much closed down. Well, I went there, and they didn't have any information. I said, why don't we go over to the administration building? So we went over to the administration building, and people had begun arriving there. And we, as I recall, and Bob, remember, this is my memories of this, so I may be a little foggy on it after 46 years. We had a two-pair <coughs> telephone system, and the uh, <coughs> operator had returned, and we were getting phone calls in the various offices. <coughs> we didn't have any information, really, that we could give out to people, and we were answering the telephone and talking to parents and probably some wives. <coughs> and said, we'll call you back as soon as we know anything. There was a football game going on in the stadium, and they made the announcement down there, as I understand. I wasn't obviously there. After a short time, it was decided that, and I didn't know where it was decided, but I just heard, that Everett Chandler would fly to Toledo. And the campus was really a different place in those days, as Don said. <coughs> And when the decision was made for Chan to fly to Toledo, he needed travel funds, and Don Nelson was there. He was the business manager. He wrote a travel advance. 
Duke Hill was there. <coughs> he was the manager of the bookstore. He opened the giant safe, cashed the travel advance check, and gave it to me. And they'd called uh, Tom Rice, who had Rice Travel Bureau downtown. And Tom went in. And this must be close to 9 or 10 at night, <coughs> perhaps a little later. Uh, and I went down to Tom Rice's office that he'd opened up and uh, paid him for the ticket and brought the ticket back. Went over to the auto shop, and I think probably Jim Carrington came in to, to give us a car. And Chan said, Bob, will you drive me to San Francisco? Sure. So we went to his house in, uh, in Atascadero, uh, and he had called his wife and said, pack me a, a bag. I've got to go to Toledo. She was ironing some white shirts when we got there. And it's, it must be something just before midnight. And Chan looked at me, and he said, you're going to be more alert if you take a shower. Well, I'd already had a shower. <laughs> but if you know Chan, like I know Chan, when he got that look and said, you better do something, you did it. So I went in and took a shower, even though I had no other clothes to change to, put on the same clothes, tied the same tie on, and we got in the state car and drove to San Francisco Airport. I didn't know it, but <coughs> they had held the United plane for him. When, well, we, when we walked in to check him in, the, uh, the woman that checked us in said, the chief of police of Toledo is going to meet you. Well, Chan was dressed like most of us are today, and he looked at me, and he said, if the chief of police is going to meet me, I better be wearing a tie. Give me your tie. <laughs> so I took off my badge and gave it to him, and uh, he told me that uh, they had held the plane for him in San Francisco. We got there about 5 a.m., and that when they landed in Chicago, they didn't taxi up to the, the gate to unload. They taxied over where another plane was waiting, took him and his suitcase off, put him on the other plane, and flew him to Toledo. A little, if it could be a funny thing happening out of all this, was we prohibited fireworks on the campus all the time I was there. And when I checked out Guy Hannigan's uh, materials to his survivor, there's a little bag of firecrackers. I listed it, one bag of firecrackers, and gave it to him. But it was a time that I'll never forget, just like Gil. You live through those things, and, and you don't think you can go on, but you, you do. If you have a memory that you'd like to share with the group, I, I remember being called at home and asked to come over to the administration building. And uh, I, all I saw was sort of chaos and confusion and a lot of bad information from the Red Cross. We were, we were, they just were, they, nobody knew exactly what had happened back there for a long time. Okay, any other, any other, anybody else that, please, if you have a comment you'd like to make, uh, any, any experience? Come on up. Come on up. Anybody else? We're going to have two more uh, short speakers. All right. Go ahead. Pat O'Daniels. I was at San Jose State at our homecoming game 